First Peter. First Peter chapter five. For just a minute tonight, we want to talk about this. And a lot of times on Sunday nights, we do what I refer to as Christianity 101. But it's good to it's good to be reminded sometimes. You know, you, you drive down the road. Diane and I, we get tickled at signs. You know, we were able to go up the mountains for about the past week, the week before we went up for a couple of days. And, you know, we're driving along. She'll look at me and say, did you see that sign? I said, yeah, but I couldn't take time to read it. You know, I'm driving. And uh, so she said, this is what it said. And some of them we laugh about. Some of them we want to cry about. And, you know, it's just funny how you see all these signs everywhere, you know. And, and every once in a while, you see signs that say, keep out. Now, there's a reason that they're there, right? Either the person that owns land just don't want nobody there, and so he puts a keep out, no trespassing sign, or either it says keep out to keep you from hurting yourself because it's dangerous to be in there. Maybe it's a work site or something like that. There are reasons that they put those signs there. But what would happen if you owned a piece of property and you caught somebody else putting keep out signs on your property. I mean, you might think it, but, but at the same time, what right do they have to put those keep out signs on your property? They don't. They don't. The problem, and, and, and Peter was writing here, and he was telling you Christians what to watch out for. And what was he telling them to watch out for? He was telling them to watch out for Satan. Look out for the devil, okay? Because the devil's up to no good. Nothing that he ever does is good. You know what? I, I, I heard that growing up. You know, I mean, I, I went to school with some boys down here in Tifton. And uh, one of them, they let out of jail to go to junior senior, but he had to be back at midnight. <laughs> I mean, that's just the kind of people that were. You know, some of them, they were kind of, they, and they were probably alcohol involved. Like I'm sure it was. And, and, you know, mom and dad used to tell me, you don't need to hang around those people because they ain't never up to any good. And when they get in trouble, you're going to get in trouble too. Now, they didn't invite me to go with them the night that he got locked up, and I'm glad. Uh, I wouldn't have gone anyway because I figured, no, that mm -mm, it ain't going to be good. And then the next day I heard that he got locked up, and there was a good reason why he got locked up. And I don't know what they did to him. He shot a guy in the back. But, you know, I don't know... I don't know what they ever did to him. I, I don't think I have seen him since we graduated. They let him out to graduate, too. But, uh, you know, it's it, it, there are signs put up, and a lot of times they're for our good, but sometimes there are signs that are put up that are seeming. Okay? Now, Satan wants to keep you out of certain areas, okay? But what are the areas he wants to keep you out of? He wants to keep you out of the areas that God wants you in. Okay? And that's why I say, you can't just go put up signs on somebody's property that you don't know them and they haven't given you permission. Okay? You can't put a sign on something that doesn't belong to you. But Satan does that. He tries to do that with us as Christians. Okay? And um, he wants to keep us out of these areas of God's will for our life. That's what he wants to keep us out of. Okay? And sometimes... His tactics are very obvious, but sometimes they're very subtle. The Bible says he is a deceiver, okay? He doesn't always just come right out and say what he's doing. He tries to gradually get you out of those areas, okay? But he wants to confuse you and tell you that God's ways and God's will is off limits. And he's, uh, I think, having a lot of success these days, but Satan has no control over something that's not his. And what we have to understand is we're not his. We're God's as Christians. And we have to keep that in mind. I want you to stand with me as we read in 1 Peter chapter 5. I'm just going to read two verses. Verses 8 and 9. These are, these are, uh, this is a big warning from Peter. Okay, It says, be sober, be vigilant. That word sober there means be serious. It means take this seriously. Listen to what I'm telling you. He says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, 
walk is about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions that are accomplished in your brethren, that word accomplished there is literally translated who also are going through these things, okay? They're affected by these things. These afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Stern warning from Peter about being careful how much room we give the devil. We ought not to be giving him any. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I ask that we would take heed to your word, Heavenly Father. I pray that we would, uh, Lord, when you give us warnings like this, be very serious about it and take it seriously. And Heavenly Father, I ask that you would help us to understand tonight so that we might better serve you and live for you and be victorious in our Christian life. For us in your name we pray. <laughs> so, <laughs> Satan has no control over what is not his, but there are certain areas of blessing that he wants to keep us out of. Now, before I, I go into those things, I want to tell you a little story. I read this a long time ago. Apparently, there was a Haitian pastor my daddy, uh, back in 1978 or 79, had the opportunity to go with another pastor to the island of Haiti and to hold a week-long revival there. And they would go twice a day uh, and preach the word. And daddy said it was different because he had to have an interpreter. Uh, and so he would have to say something and then the, let the interpreter speak. And then he'd have to say something and have the interpreter speak. But he said... The thing that struck me most about this is how many people showed up. He said, there was one night that they told us there was a million people there. Now, that's hard to believe. Those people had a desire to hear the Word of God. And then he said, I don't know how many of them got saved because there were people from all over our country down there to, to, to talk to these people when they came forward and they had to have interpreters and all that. But he said those people that were there talking to people after the service, they'd be there all night leading people to Christ because they felt conviction to come to Christ. He said, I've never experienced anything like it in my life. And my daddy bought, brought back some Haitian coins and things, and I've still got them in my house. And I look at them from time to time, and I think about that. The other thing he told me was that they were so poor. Now, folks, you're talking about being blessed in this nation. The hotel that they stayed in, uh, what, it, it wasn't five star, believe it. Uh, there was a bed there, and there was a, a table with a, with a bowl there that they bring fresh water every day for you to bathe out of and, you know, stuff like that. They didn't have running water in there. And uh, he said every morning he would be awakened by the sound of trucks, huge military trucks coming through the streets picking up the people who had died of starvation that night off the street. And he said, I looked down there that first morning and I saw this truck go by and it was just piled high with bodies. Of people who had starved to death during the night. And he said, there was a, a maid that worked at that hotel and she walked like 15, 20 miles one way to get to work every day. And she got paid very, very little. But it was, uh, it, it was something that she had to have. And Daddy said him and the other preacher, they decided that they would, you know, give her some money before they left to help her and her family. And they witnessed to her, and she came to the meeting, and I think she made a profession of faith that week. But anyway, before they left, uh, Daddy and this other preacher got some money together, and I can't remember how much it was. I think it was 50 or $75 that they had that they gave her, okay? And the, the evangelist who invited them down there said, please, please don't tell anybody that you did that because if anybody finds out she has that money, she'll be dead before she gets home. They will kill her and take that money while she's on the way. Folks, we just don't know how blessed we are. But I read this story. I kind of got off subject there. But I read this story about a Haitian pastor who was preaching to his congregation one day, and he told them this story, and it had to do with Satan and how Satan operates. And it was more like a parable that he was telling, but he said that there was a man who wanted to sell his house, and he was asking $2,000 for the house. And he said there was another man that really wanted to buy it, but he couldn't afford the full price. 
And so they negotiated a little bit and they talked. And so the man that owned the house that was going to sell it for $2,000 agreed after some time that he would sell it for $1,000, which the other man could afford. He said, but there's a stipulation. And the man said, what's the stipulation? And he looked above the front door and there was a nail protruding out of the wall on the outside. He said, I retain ownership of that nail right there. And so the man said, okay, because what's it going to hurt if he comes and gets his name? You know, he could get his name. And so they did the deal. Well, a couple of years later, the man that had originally sold the house came back to the man that had bought it and said, I want to buy the house back. Well, the man didn't want to sell it. He said, we're comfortable here. My family is settled. We want to stay here. We like the house. And the man said, but I want to buy it back. And the man said, no, we're not going to sell it to you. And so the man that originally owned the house and who still owned that one nail, he went and got a rope and he went and killed this animal and hung it on that nail. Right there in the front door. Dead animal. And you think, take it down. He can't do that. He owned the nail. He can do what he wants to with the nail. And of course, he was greedy and said, it's his nail. If he wants to hang a dead animal on that nail, he can't. Well, you know what happened. Before long, you couldn't stay in the house because of the smell, and the man was forced to sell it back to him. Now, what is the moral of this story? We come to Christ, and we want to give him part of our life. But we want Satan hang on just a little bit. Folks, let me tell you something. If you let Satan keep one little peg, then he's going to hang his rotten garbage on it before it's over. We have to surrender to Christ everything that we have. Every part of us has to be surrendered to Christ or Satan has a foothold. Now, he don't own us anymore, but he has influence. <coughs> and that's what Satan wants to do. We have to give it all to God. We have to take advantage of his blessings. And these blessings are what Satan wants to keep us away from. He doesn't want us to receive the blessing of God. So what are the blessings that we're talking about? Well, first of all, it's the blessing of prayer. Folks, do you really think about prayer being a blessing? I do. What does the Bible say about prayer? Well, it says a whole lot about prayer, but let me tell you what Matthew 21, 22 says. It says, And all things whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believing you shall receive. You know who said that? Jesus did. That's red letter in my Bible. It says, all things whatsoever you ask in prayer, believing, you'll receive. When you pray and ask God for something, do you expect Him to answer that prayer? I do. God said He would. Now, we might not get the result that we want because, you know, we have to pray that God's will be done. It might not be God's will to do it the way we want it done, but when God does it, and He will do it, and He will answer it, He's going to answer for our best. We know that because he tells us that. Look, prayer is a blessing. How much do we really pray? Do you start your day off with prayer? I pray. I catch myself going down the road praying all the time. Something will pop into my mind. I'll say, Lord, you know what? I want to lift that person up today. I want them to have a good day. Lord, bless them today. Lord, uh, help them today. Encourage them today. You know, or either I'm praying about a situation. Look, I, you know, I get up every morning and I start praying, Lord, today I want to do what you want me to do. God, I want to fulfill what your will in my life today. And then I start praying for my wife and I pray for my children and my, my uh, children's families. I pray for my other family. I pray for the church. I pray for individual members of the church. I just catch myself all the time praying and asking God for things. And God says, Jesus said, if you ask believing, then you'll receive it. And folks, I, let me tell you something. I know people pray for me. It's an encouragement to me to know that. You know, I got a phone call. It's been a couple of weeks ago, just right out of blue from a man from Arkansas, and I've met him before. And he just called me and said, you know, Pastor, I was just thinking about you today, and I want you to be encouraged. I've been praying for you. Let me tell you something. It did me a lot of good. I hung up the phone and I told Diane, I was about to cry. I said, I needed that, and God knew I needed that. You know what? That's, that's, that's what we should be doing. It is a privilege. It is a blessing for us to pray. But look, Satan don't want us praying. Why? Because he don't want our prayers to be answered. 
He doesn't want us to receive those blessings. He doesn't want you praying because he knows that prayer is where our power is. You know, we're not strong. The Bible tells us that. We are weak. We're not strong. But through prayer and the power of Christ, we can overcome anything. You know, I cut up with my brother up in, in Warner Robins. Brother Julius. <laughs> brother Julius is six foot six, black as smut. Every time I see him, man, he hugs me and about squeezes the air right out of him because he's got 29 inch biceps. That is a, a woo he But let me tell you something. He's my brother, you hear me? I pray for him every day. You know, I pray for all of them up there every day. God doesn't want us to pray because that's where our power is. You know, I used to go on calls with him. And, 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 you know, I have to admit it, there were times when I really wanted somebody to fight. I really did. I wanted, to, I wanted to have a reason. And you know what? When I was in that kind of mood, God was looking out for me. You know what? Every time I'd go on a call, when I was in that kind of mood, guess who showed up back me up? Julius. And when he got out of the car, they went, nope, not happening today. We ain't gonna get we ain't gonna tie up with that joker. And I cut up with him all the time. You know, somebody be great to stand, I say, hey Jay, take care of my life work for me, man. He just kind of laughed. Folks, let me tell you something. Ain't no way I I don't know how much weight that man can pick up. I know what I've seen him do out there on the street, and I don't want to be on the receiving end of it, but I can tell you somebody's stronger. And that's easy. Our Heavenly Father has all the power in the world. You know what? Who'd have thought that a little bitty Adam had as much power in it as it does? Folks, let me tell you. The God that I serve is powerful, and Satan doesn't, doesn't want us praying. He wants to keep us from that blessing of the power of God in our life. But there's another area that he wants to keep us out of, and he doesn't want us to know the truth. He wants to keep us from the truth. Now, the truth is in the Word of God. You remember the parable Jesus told about the sower and the seed? And he said he went out and he started sowing, and some of the seeds, it says, fell by the wayside. What happened to those seeds? Do you remember? The birds came and ate them. They didn't fall on the plowed up ground. They fell over here on the hard ground on the wayside on the side of the road, and, and they didn't come up. Why didn't they come up? Because before they had a chance to take root, the birds came and ate them. And so, uh, and that's in Mark <coughs> chapter 4. And if you look at verse 15, and Jesus says, And these are they by the wayside which, where the word is sown, but when they have heard, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. Why does Satan want to take away the word? Because he doesn't want it to take root. Because he doesn't want them to know the truth. Because he doesn't want you to know the truth. It says immediately that when that word fell on their heart, Satan took it out of their heart. Because he does not want them to know the truth. He wants you to believe wrong doctrine. A lot of that going around. A lot of wrong doctrine going around. And Satan wants to keep us from the blessing of the word of God. From the blessings of the truth. That's what he wants to keep us away from. And he does not want you to study the Word. I have to be honest with you. There are times, you know, I kind of try to keep a schedule when I'm going to do things. And I have to get ready for Wednesday, and I have to get ready for Sunday morning and Sunday night, and I have to get my Sunday school lesson prepared. And I'm thinking, based on what I've got on the schedule to do for the next week, when I need to sit down and get this stuff done. And you know what? It seems like, there's always something that comes up to try to keep me away from the Word of God. I know what that is. That's just Satan. And to be honest with you, sometimes Satan puts things in my mind. You know what? You can go fishing for a couple of hours. And I could. The problem is that I don't need to go fishing for a couple of hours. I need to be in the Word of God. And so that's what I do. And folks, listen. He wants to keep us out of the Word because He wants to keep us from the blessing of the truth. He wants to keep us out of the Word. There's another thing that He wants to keep from us, and that's worship. Let me tell you something. <laughs> Satan hates it when God's people start worshiping. He hates it. He doesn't want us worshiping. 
you know, we were talking about Acts. You look at the early church. It says, and they uh, remained and studied in the apostles' doctrine and everything, but how often did they go to church? Every day. What did they do when they got there? They worshiped every day. They worshiped. And they wanted to be there. Folks, Satan doesn't want us worshiping. He hates it when we worship. Okay? And he will put things that seem more appealing in front of us to keep us from worshiping. You know, and there's some people like seven day events. They say, oh, y'all just be all worship ain't going to mean nothing. You do it on the wrong day. Let me tell you something. No matter what day you're worshiping on, as long as you're worshiping God. And you know, we worship on Sundays. That's when we meet together. We meet together on Wednesdays. That's fine. The fact is, it doesn't matter when we do it. It's what we're doing that Satan doesn't want. And he doesn't want us worshiping together. So what does he do? He throws all this stuff out there in front of us and says, oh, you got to do this and you got to do that. You can't do this. Folks, let me tell you something. He'll do anything he can to keep us from worshiping. He hates it. He even tried to get Christ to worship him instead of worship the Father. When Christ was being tempted in the wilderness, he said, you know what? If you'll fall down and worship me, everything you see will be yours. I give it to you. Now, you know what? <laughs> I, I, you know, God says, you know, Word says that you will worship the Lord your God and no other. You won't put anybody up before him. I, I know in the back of Jesus' mind, he said, I'm thinking, you don't own everything you're telling me that I can have. It's already mine. It's already mine. But folks, he doesn't want us to worship. But there's another area of blessing, and some people don't see this as a blessing, and I'll explain what I mean in a minute. And that's your witness. Your witness. I was talking to Brother Reuben this morning as he was going out, and he said, you know what, my daddy... Uh, you see, you know, and, and he told you know, when I was telling you about my brother David, the law officer, he said, you know, now what we have here is say to do right. He said, on my class ring, on our class ring, when we got our class ring, we graduated from high school. He said, you know what's on that class ring? I said, I don't know what. He said, do right. On their class ring. I said, really? I said, that's a good thing. He said, do right. It's on my class ring. I still got it. It says, do right. That's a good thing. I think y'all put on all of them nowadays. Just do right. Well, there's a lot of people doing wrong. But he said there's another thing. My daddy always told me, he said, keep a good name. Because a good name will open doors for you. A bad name will shut. You know what? He's right. And you know, when it comes to our witness, Satan does a lot of things. Number one, he'll take away our confidence. I've asked people, hey, did you witness somebody today or witness somebody last week? No, I can't do that. I just can't talk to people. What is that? That's Satan. That's Satan. Let me tell you something. All you got to do is say, God, I feel like that person needs you and I want to talk to them, but you got to help me. I guarantee you, you can do it. You can do it because God says he will help you do that. The Spirit will make them ready. If God's talking to you and saying you need to go witness to that person, God's already working on that person. All you got to do is go up and start a conversation. And folks, that's not hard to do, but Satan takes away your confidence and says you can't do it. But you know what? Satan also tells you, hey, you can't do that. You can't witness anybody. You remember that time. You remember that time. Folks, let me tell you something. Mama used to tell me some things that made a lot of sense, and she said her parents told her, and they made a lot of sense then. She said, don't ever go anywhere or do anything you'd be ashamed of if Jesus come back and taught you to. That's pretty good advice. That's pretty good advice. But you know what? We're all sinful. We all make mistakes. There are things in our past that we're not proud of. And you know what? You, you start to go witness somebody. You feel led to go witness. Satan's going to put this thought in your mind. Oh, wait a minute. Who are you to go talk to them? You hit the crit. Remember this time? But folks, listen. You just need to tell Satan, that was before I gave my heart to Christ. And you don't have any control over me anymore. But Satan doesn't want you witnessing. He reminds you that you're not good enough. Folks, so what are we supposed to do? Well, it says right there, whom resists steadfast in the faith. 
we have to keep our faith in Jesus. Knowing that we're not strong enough to be Satan, but, but having faith that Jesus is, and knowing that Jesus is, we have to keep our faith in Christ. And you know what? We have to remember this, that our Father owns what Satan is trying to take, and he can't take it because it belongs to the Father. He can't have you. And you know, this is something that I always like too. You know, I just like to look at Satan and say, you know what, Satan, you can try. But I've already won. I've already got the victory. You know what? There's a verse of scripture that I like. I get frustrated sometimes. I get frustrated sometimes and I think, Lord, how long are you going to let this mess go on? How long are you going to let these, these corrupt people keep doing what they're doing? How in the world, uh, you know, how long is it going to go on? Lord, why don't you just judge them and judge them now? It ain't up to me to say when God judges. It's not up to me to be the judge. But I know this, we've already won the victory. We have won. You know what? I like this verse scripture in Revelation chapter 20. Verse 10 says this, And the devil that deceived them. What's the Satan called in scripture? He's called a deceiver, right? And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. That tells me that right now we might struggle with this stuff. But we have to remember, number one, keep our faith in Christ, knowing that God is strong. Okay? And, and we have to, we remember that God owns us, not Satan. And remember that we've already won the victory. The day is coming when Satan, we won't have to worry about him. I look forward to that day for so I do. Folks, when I don't have to battle him, I get plum tired of it sometimes. I do. I get plum tired of having to fight Satan. But one day, we won't have to do that and we've already won. All we got to do is look at it and say, you know what, Satan? You cannot win this battle because my God is more powerful. My God is great. And he's already won. You know what? <laughs> the day that Jesus got hung on that cross, Satan lost the kingdom. Nothing he can do about it. Folks, don't let Satan put signs up that keep you away from the blessings that God has for you. It's a blessing for us to be able to pray. It's a blessing for us to be able to study the Word of God and know the truth. It's a blessing for us to witness, and it's a blessing for us to worship. Don't let Satan keep you from those blessings, but he's going to try. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Heavenly Father, that you explain things to us so that we can understand. I pray, Heavenly Father, that we would allow you complete control in our life. And, Heavenly Father, that Satan could not come against us. Lord, we are weak, but you are strong. And, Lord, I pray that you would be strong for us this week. Lord, I pray that we might take advantage of the blessings that you have for us so that we can be strengthened and be victorious in you. Heavenly Father, I pray that of each and every person in our church. Father, take this time now and use it as you will for it's in your name we pray. Amen.